Hello again, I am Blunty. This is a speed booster. It is a lens adapter designed to take a lens for a DSLR camera, like this for example, and adapt it for use onto a mirrorless camera, like this Micro Four Thirds camera for example. Normally they don't smash together so well, but the thing that makes this lens adapter different is the lens it has in its own middle there. So you can use an adapter like this, it's just a mount adapter, a dumb adapter if you will. It's just a mechanical way to change to, you know, take the mount from this and attach it onto this. And it doesn't really do anything for the lens, which means because the sensor in this is smaller than the sensor that this lens was designed for on the DSLRs, you get a crop factor. It doesn't use the entire image circle, the entire projection from the lens, which means you get cropped, which means this lens winds up not being as wide as it should, things like that. That's where speed boosters come in. It's got a lens in its in a sort of middle here that's designed to compensate for that. So when you put this lens onto this adapter, like a so, this lens actually takes that image projection and squeezes it back down again into a size appropriate for this camera. So in doing that, it actually concentrates that light, which is why it gets its name Speed Booster, because it makes the lens effectively faster. It increases the f-stop, basically. So instead of being an f1.7, you get effectively an f sort of one-ish. It's a bit wibbly on the math, but that's kind of the point. But although the boost to low light shooting is a nice bonus, most people don't use them for that because quite frankly, today's cameras are really quite good in low light. And you don't really need that extra stop of light like you may have done, you know, a fistful of years ago. Most people use these speed booster adapters so they can use their old DSLR lenses onto their new mirrorless camera systems they may have upgraded to away from the older flappy mirror old fashioned cameras because investing in lenses is quite an expensive prospect. And that's that's where all your money goes when you get a camera system, it's lenses. Camera bodies, replaceable. I mean, yes, they're expensive too, but your lenses last you through several camera bodies. So these are by far the most important investment you can make. And when you switch camera systems, you can sometimes leave those lenses behind, which is a bit heartbreaking, especially in the case of something like this, which is the Sigma 18 to 35. I love this lens. And even though I haven't shot on DSLRs in many, many, many years, I couldn't quite bring myself to get rid of it. So with a speed booster, you can not only use your old lenses, I mean, you could do that with a very, very cheap dummy adapter, like we told before, but you don't make any compromises to the effective uh, field of view, the effective focal length on your lenses, basically. So that's a nice bonus as well. All right, so now that we've gone over the basic dummy mode stuff for those people who may not be familiar with what a speed booster is and does, let's talk about this one specifically. This is the cheapest speed booster that I could find available to me. It is just about 150 Australian dollars or about 100 bucks American, basically. And considering that some of the uh, bigger name, fancier speed boosters can go for well over $1,000, it seems uh, like a pretty good deal. Might be too good to be true, perhaps, but I bought one to find out. This one specifically, and let me read the name properly so I get it right. The Gorilla Film Gear Focal Reducer Canon EF EFS Lens to Micro Four Thirds Mount Camera M43 Speed Booster. That's its description on Amazon. It magnifies the image by a factor of 1.5 times, which reduces the effective focal length by a factor of 0.72 times and increases the lens speed by roughly one stop. Compared to the expensive models, you are, of course, giving up some important things. There's no electronics, no data or electrical connection from the lens to the camera at all. So the camera has no idea what focal length you're shooting at, and it can't control or measure aperture, and it can't control focus. And if your lens has it, it cannot make use of its inbuilt stabilization or anti-vibration features. If your camera has in-body stabilization, that should still work fine, so long as your camera lets you manually set a focal length so it knows how much to correct for movement. If you forget to do this or set it incorrectly, the in-body stabilization can behave rather poorly, potentially ruining your shot, so keep an eye on that. Double check your manual if you don't know how to do it. It is important. The no autofocus thing can be a bit of a challenge for some. Others, like me, will rather enjoy being forced to slow down and do it all manually. But if you pair a fast lens with a speed booster, your depth of field can tend to get rather quite thin, especially with telephoto lenses. I was shooting on my Panasonic GH5, which has a rather excellent set of focus assist tools, including a punch-in, which I've set to a function key on the back, and also a contrast highlighting feature. So even in video mode, on relatively slow-moving subjects, it was surprisingly easy to keep things in focus. I was testing with three different lenses. The first was obviously the ever-classic Sigma 18-35 f1.8 art lens, which I've been in love with ever since I reviewed it at launch back in 2013. 
Sadly, as I mentioned before, it wasn't long after that when I switched over my daily driver and production camera tools to Micro Four Third systems, meaning for years I've barely used what I considered to be one of the very best lenses on the face of the planet, which upset me. For a prime lens, I was testing with the Ever Classic Canon EF 28mm f1.8. Again, one of my favourites from back in the day when I was shooting with Canon DSLRs. And again, a lens that I love so much I just couldn't bear to part with it. So it's been sitting in a drawer idle for quite some time. And finally, for a telephoto zoom, I've got my Tamron 70-300 f4-5.6. to It's a lens I don't have any particular sentimental attachment to like I do the other two, but it offered great bang for buck for someone like me, who doesn't really shoot telephoto that often, but sometimes needed to, so it was an incredibly good value and a surprisingly good lens for its price. Now, the biggest issue with using a telephoto with the Gorilla Speed Booster was the lack of electronics making the Tamron vibration control useless. And at long focal lengths, the in-body stabilization of the EH5 did well for photos, but in video it was less than ideal, especially when tracking moving subjects, of course. However, I did go for worst case scenario. I was shooting completely handheld, sometimes kneeling and using one knee for stabilization and using the viewfinder as often as practical for another point of body contact to help stabilize the camera. And I was still getting a decently practical setup, if slow because of the long focal throw of this lens. For the wide angle lenses, both the Sigma Zoom and the Canon Prime, there was one problem of particular issue, the failure to be able to focus to infinity, which made landscape shots largely impossible. I did find that if you zoom the Sigma to 24mm and beyond, you could get infinity focus, but still not quite as sharp as native. The inability to focus to infinity is a common issue with many of the cheaper and some of the first few models of the expensive ones of these speed boosters, so I wasn't surprised to find that issue here. And it does rather limit the usefulness of this adapter in a run and gun setup. But anything except standard landscape still works surprisingly well at all focal lengths. In fact, for close up and macro style shots, both the Prime and the Zoom did wonderfully well. I was very much enjoying myself with them. The bokeh quality of all lenses is retained through the additional lens element of the speed booster. They are perhaps ever so slightly softer and less contrasty maybe than native, but not significantly so, and certainly nothing that can't be easily corrected either in post or even by in-camera setting tweaks. With an extra lens element in the mix that these lenses were never designed for, you do tend to get a little bit of extra flair, of course, that's to be expected, but the flair I got was... Quite nice, actually. I'm a bit of a fan of lens flare. I tend to use it when I can because I kind of like the effect. It gives a bit of drama or, or something to it. I like it. But the other problem you face with this adapter is aperture because without electronic controls through this, your camera can't control the aperture blades in the lenses themselves. So this solves that problem by giving you its own aperture blades, which are, you know, nice and round and everything. So it doesn't sort of mess with your bokeh too much. But there is another issue. They can be useful for small adjustments to cope with very bright light, but past about a third into their total range, you do get some very obvious vignetting on all focal lengths. And past about halfway, it's basically unusably obnoxious. So resign yourself to shooting basically wide open at all times and forget about it. In general terms, I had no issues with sharpness, chromatic aberration, or other unwanted image artifacting caused by the additional lens element. It's not the most optically perfect image possible, of course it's not. You're putting another lens in the way, just by nature of how the device works. But it does a surprisingly good job at not getting in the way of what these lenses do. Quite frankly, I was expecting something significantly worse from such a cheap adapter. On the physical side, it feels well enough made, largely metal construction, smooth operation, and a secure feeling lens mount attaches on both sides. There is a little bit of play. I'll see if I can get you to hear it. You can almost see it there, can't you? Just a little bit of play, which when you're adjusting focus, you'll feel, but it's not something that ever really got in the way. You kind of get used to it and ignore it after a while, but you can, you know, every time you go to fiddle with that lens, you can feel it just go chunk, 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 just, just a fraction, just a fraction, you know, maybe... Well, it's probably less than a millimeter of movement, really. So would I recommend this adapter for proper video content production? Kinda. Certainly not for the on-the-go vlogging, travel, or event coverage stuff, but for in-studio use, where you can spend more time setting up a shot properly, yeah, this thing can be put to use while shooting B-roll, or taking locked-down, talking-head-style interview shots, and basically anything where manual focus is practical to use. 
For people focused more on stills, yes, absolutely, except for the stuff that really needs autofocus, like wildlife and sports photography, and of course, landscape photography, because of the infinity focus problem. Product shooting, portraiture, still life, close up, and macro style shooting are all a lot of joy with a setup like this. Being forced to slow down by the manual only setup can actually give you the time to really think about your shot even more carefully, and perhaps even wind up getting you a better shot than you originally would have got if you just relied on all the auto fetches. Well, that's cool. Click, moving on. So if you have upgraded from a DSLR system to a mirrorless system, but sort of don't want to walk away from the investment you made in these lenses to begin with, this is a cheap and relatively affordable way to put these lenses back to use. Is it perfect? No, of course not. But it is pretty damn good for the money being asked for it. Of course, if you are a more professional and serious shooter and things like that, and this is sort of part and parcel of, of what you need for a daily driver to make you money every each and every day, then of course you want to invest in one of the fancier ones. But if you just want something sort of supplementary to what you're already doing with your mirrorless system, you've got a couple of these lenses sitting around you'd rather make use of if you could, then, you know, 100, 150 bucks could be worth it. Thanks for watching. I'm Lanty. I will catch you next time. And... Happy shooting. Wait, how did I use it? I forget how I signed off some of my photography videos back when I was doing way more of them, which I'm going to be doing more, by the way. This is kind of the official start of focusing more on photography stuff again. But yeah, when I was doing the, the videos for the camera store, how did I sign off? Happy shooting? Something? It was something stupid. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'm Blondie. I'll catch you next time. I'll just stick with the classic. I've been doing it for like 13 years.